Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. Many years ago I had the opportunity to meet Carlo Fuentes and he signed my copy of La Muerte de Artemio Cruz or The Death of Artemio Cruz which I have right here in my typical Catedra editions which are the ones that I always recommend if you want to read the text in Spanish. Now, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? I had not read the book at that time when he signed it, so I'm afraid that if Carlos Fuentes had asked me, Jorge, what do you think of my novel? Was there a specific scene or a specific moment that is your favorite? I would have had to say, well, honestly, uh, probably the, the part where Artemio Cruz dies. You know, I, I thought that that was really, really well done. So for many years, this was a great source of shame for me. And it was last week, or a couple of weeks ago, actually, that I finally decided to do something about that. Now, I'm not an expert on Carlo Fuentes by any means. I have read his first novel, Where the Air is Clear. I also read Aura, the famous little novella that he wrote, which is one of my favorite novellas. I also read Cumpleaños. I don't have a copy of Where the Air is Clear or of Cumpleaños. Cumpleaños or Birthdays was a very difficult read for me. And then now I have just read The Death of Artemio Cruz and that's basically all that I have experienced of the work of Carlos Fuentes. But The Death of Artemio Cruz is one of the key novels of the Latin American boom and it has some amazing connections to other texts. So what do you say? Let's look at it. La Muerte de Artemio Cruz, The Death of Artemio Cruz was published in 1962 and it is Carlos Fuentes's third novel. So the first one was Where the Air is Clear, then The Good Conscience, which is a more traditional type of story, and then comes The Death of Artemio Cruz, which was published actually the same year that Aura was published. So it's really an amazing year, 1962, in the context of Carlos Fuentes. It is not a long novel at all. As you may know, the Cátedra editions come with lengthy introductions most of the time and also notes. So basically this is the preliminary material. This is the actual novel. And as I said, it's around uh, 300 pages. And it is one of those novels that have a spoiler title. You know what I'm saying? It's just like the death of Ivan Illich. Do you think that Artemio Cruz is going to die in this novel? It's a little bit of a spoiler, you know. But uh, yes, in the death of Artemio Cruz, Artemio Cruz dies, okay? So this is the story of Artemio Cruz, who in his agony relives some past moments in his life. That is the basic premise. A central theme is the Mexican Revolution. That would be probably the most obvious theme that you can find in this novel. And it is explored from the perspective of a man who fought in it and who later on betrayed it. But there's much more to the novel than that. This is not simply a novel of the Mexican Revolution. Another major aspect of the life of Artemio Cruz that he likes to revisit or that he is inevitably revisiting in this novel has to do with his love affairs, which also include his marriage. So another theme I would say is lovelessness, or if you let me rephrase that, the inability to love. That would be a second important theme here. He also has a son and a daughter, so a large part of his memories have to do with them. We hear a lot about these characters and also about Artemio's relationship with them. And also, when the novel begins in his agony, right, we are really plunged in medias res into the story. So we encounter the agony of Artemio Cruz directly from the very start. And his wife Catalina and his daughter Teresa are with him throughout this agony. But in fact, if you look at Artemio Cruz as a man, he is really alone. So solitude, a very dear theme to Gabriel Garcia Marquez also, becomes a third prominent theme that I would like to emphasize in the death of Artemio Cruz. Now, the Mexican Revolution, lovelessness or an inability to love, solitude, this probably makes you think of another famous Mexican text. I'm thinking, of course, of Pedro Paramo. There are actually many connections between the two characters and the situation that they find themselves in. The death of Artemio Cruz has a very interesting structure, if we are going to look at how the text is constructed, because it combines, first, 
second, yes, second, and third person narration. So you have that structure that is divided and basically the novel is really a braid of the I, you, and he perspectives. So let's look at what we have in each one of these. In the I parts or sequences, this is Artemio Cruz basically dying, right? So we have him in the hospital in the present moment. So the I section is related to that always, the present moment. In the U section, which is maybe stylistically the most interesting one, this is Artemio Cruz's conscience and it is addressing him, it is confronting him, accusing him. And very interestingly, it is narrated in a future tense for the most part. And then finally, of course, we have the he sections. These are Artemio Cruz's memory. And basically, he is remembering past events in a disjointed manner. So this is, of course, connected to the past tense. So you can see how we have the three important tenses related to each one of the perspectives of the narrator. And throughout the novel, what you're going to find is a stream of consciousness technique. You can find it in all of the three sections that are here present, but it is in the you uh, sections that you find it most prominently, the ones that deal with his conscience. But as I said, uh, be aware that that stream of consciousness, you're going to find it throughout. It's just that in the you sections, it's a little bit more focused on that. So who is Artemio Cruz? Okay, since the novel focuses on him, that is a valid question. And we find about him little by little as we put together the pieces that we are provided with. The novel is really a wonderful puzzle if you look at it that way. And Artemio Cruz, I'm afraid, is clearly not a good guy. Okay, he fought bravely in the Mexican Revolution, but then he sold out and eventually he became rich by taking advantage of other people. So this is a fallen character who may once have been heroic at one point in his life, but that is not the case anymore. And here is something that I encourage you to explore as you read this novel, taking into consideration this idea of the character who's definitely not a good guy, definitely not a hero. Is there a moment in the reading experience where you begin to feel for him, where you begin to sympathize with him or care about him? And if so, I would encourage you to try to find out when that happens for you. This may be different for different readers, but that point, right, at which we might begin to care about him or not, because it's also a possibility that we may not. But that point is probably the important one for you in your reading experience of the death of Artemio Cruz. I mentioned Pedro Paramo before. This is another point of contact between Pedro Paramo and the death of Artemio Cruz because you also have in Pedro Paramo that character who is not a good guy but who we may end up sympathizing with or at least understanding. There's a very important connection between the novel and history, okay, the concept of history, because the death of Artemio Cruz is much more than the story of a guy who is looking back on his life. This novel is basically a pocket history of Mexico, from Padre Hidalgo's Cry of Dolores in 1810 up to the strikes of the railroad unions in 1959, which are uh, directly um, related, basically, in, in the novel, which was published, as you remember, in 1962. So while the events that we hear about are narrated in a non-linear fashion, in a fashion that you could say is more maybe experimental, if you follow those events, which, by the way, are shaped after the messy logic of memory, right? We all know about that. The sections that you find, especially in the he portions of the novel, are dated. So it's not really that difficult for us to put the puzzle together and to form a chronology of the events that are related or narrated in this novel. And basically what you get at the end, once you do that, is Fuentes' own personal view of the history of Mexico. This is always from that perspective of the narrator or even of the author, I think you, we could say uh, in this case. Artemio Cruz is a kind of an archetype, if you ask me. He represents a figure that emerged after the Mexican Revolution through which the reader can maybe come to understand the Mexico of today or at least the Mexico of the late 20th century because that is what the novel explores. The approach of the novel is the approach of history. Let's try to understand 
the past or to learn about the past so that we can understand the present and maybe give some kind of a shape to the future. So that's the connection between the novel and the concept of history. There's also a very good connection between the death of Artemio Cruz and film, the art form of film. The critic Lanin Yurko actually wrote an essay comparing the death of Artemio Cruz to a famous famous film that many times makes it to the list or, or even to the question what is the best film ever made you have probably guessed already which one I'm talking about I am referring of course to Citizen Kane we have obviously in both texts the idea of a character who is looking at his life trying to assess his life with some enigmatic maybe even problematic elements that we hope are going to be clarified as we read and as we watch. You also have that inability to love. You have the concept of the lost paradise in both of these texts. So there are many close connections between the film and the novel. And then the critic who put together this edition of Cathedra, um, basically when you get one of these Cathedra editions, it's a different person who puts together uh, each one of them. And his name is Jose Carlos González Boisho. And he mentions Citizen Kane uh, based on the article by Yurko. But he also makes another connection that I thought was quite appropriate, and that is with the movie Giant. Okay, In particular with the character played by James Dean, one of his famous performances. There were only three uh, feature film performances by James Dean in any case, but this is the one that is sometimes cited as his most interesting one. It's this vulgar man who all of a sudden finds himself rich. Okay, So connection with Artemio Cruz definitely right there. And the disjointed structure in the, um, in the novel reminded me, if you pardon this, uh, you know, allusion here or this connection that I'm going to make. I forgot to have the DVD here close by, but it's right there, but I'm not going to get up and go find it. Uh, it reminded me of one of my favorite movies, and that is 500 Days of Summer. Okay, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of lowering the, the level right here, but I think this is a really, really good film and quite sophisticated also. It's the story of a guy who is going through a breakup and he starts looking back on his relationship to try to figure out what it is that went wrong. So you can see the similarity right here, right? It, this idea that in times of distress, we have that impulse to look back on our life. That distress may be caused by illness, as is the case with Artemio Cruz, death, right? But also a breakup. A breakup is a kind of death, you know, so that uh, connection right there, it's, a, it's a definitely a possibility, the idea that we look back in order to try to understand. Now, I want to share with you some criticism of the death of Artemio Cruz, okay? I have this great book right here, it's a compilation of essays, this is from Harold Bloom and his series on uh, modern critical interpretations okay so he has these about many different novels and many different works but it has an introduction by Harold Bloom and he um, shares with us a couple of reservations that he has about Fuentes' novel and I wanted to share those with you and also some things uh, that other critics said so that we can get another perspective on the novel and then I'm going to tell you why it is that, that I'm sharing uh, this with you when I tell you about my own personal reaction to Fuentes' novel. So Harold Bloom says, and this is point number one, he says the death of Artemio Cruz is excessively derivative. Okay, he mentions Faulkner as uh, an influence, that, that is obvious. Uh, the works of Alejo Carpentier, the Cuban novelist, he also mentions Orson Welles. And what he says is that even if being derivative is not wrong in itself, he feels that what Fuentes does with this mixture of things is not particularly something that is his own or something that is, you know, new or innovative in any case. And then his second point of criticism, he says, Fuentes borrows his analysis of Mexican male character from Octavio Paz's The Labyrinth of Solitude. The idea of the Malinche, right? La chingada, los hijos de la chingada, this idea of the descendants of this violated woman. And he says basically that Artemio Cruz as a creation is basically not Fuentes' creation, but Octavio Paz's creation. So it's, it's very harsh, okay? He, he's quite uh, harsh about this. The next critic that I have is Luis Harz, okay? Not harsh, but Harz. And he says um, that the novel's most effective scenes are the linear ones, 
So basically, the most traditional aspect of the death of Artemio Cruz, according to Luis Harz, is the one that works better. And he calls the other parts, the, one that, the ones that are non-linear, for example, the I and the U sequences, mecánicas. This is the word that he uses in Spanish. He says that that part of the novel is mechanical. When you translate it into English, it doesn't quite give you the right meaning. What I take that to mean is that these other sequences that are non-linear seem calculated. They seem contrived. Okay, that's how I would sum up the ideas of Luis Harz about the death of Artemio Cruz. And finally, the third critic that I have is a guy by the name of Luis Gregoric. And this is something, he's talking about the entirety of Fuentes' work. According to Gregoric, Fuentes is a typical realist narrator that forces himself to use innovative techniques in order to make his works more relevant or more interesting, if you want to put it that way. So I think this is criticism that we have to consider, and of course we can respond to it in a positive or negative way, agreeing or disagreeing. But what I want to do now is I want to tell you about my own personal reaction to the novel. As I read The Death of Artemio Cruz, I had absolutely no doubt that I was experiencing one of the key works of the Latin American boom, one major work of Latin American fiction, and I believe a novel that really must be read. The structure, however, did seem a little bit artificial to me as I read the novel, and this is something that I thought about before I encountered the criticism that I just shared with you from Luis Harz and from Luis Gregoric. Okay, so when I read those comments, I was like, well, this is kind of what I had felt as I had been reading the novel and other books by uh, Carlos Fuentes. This idea that maybe Carlos Fuentes is at his best when he is being more of a traditional, maybe even Baroque narrator. And that the techniques, the avant-garde techniques, are basically something that feels a little bit forced sometimes. And I would say that in this Cathedra edition, I have a uh, couple of appendices and these are versions of the death of Artemio Cruz that were published before this actually saw the light in book form. They had been, uh, they had appeared in publications. And in these, it's really interesting, but in the original pieces of the novel, there's only the traditional third-person narration. The other perspectives, the I and the U, are not there. So the death of Artemio Cruz, at least, actually began as a more traditional uh, piece as a more traditional novel. That, of course, doesn't mean anything in itself. You know, uh, authors are always testing and, and trying to find new ways to um, express themselves and to make their work better. But I feel that that supports a little bit that idea that maybe the parts narrated in the more traditional way are the ones that work better. I personally don't feel that the I and U sections are justified. They do add something to the text, they are quite poetic, they are really a pleasure to read at many points, but the he sections are the ones that make up most of the novel, and I feel that those are really the better ones. So I have to say that I agree with some of the comments of these critics that I shared with you before. This was a very slow read for me. Uh, at times I could say that it even dragged, and I feel that I had to sort of force myself to finish it. I, I thought, okay, this is an important novel, okay, so I want to read it, and it's part of my, you know, my education as a reader, and I'm thankful that I did. But it was not really a smooth uh, text or a smooth experience for me. So that said, and this is the bottom line right here, I do recommend this novel to anyone who is interested in Latin American literature and in Mexican literature in particular. It may well be Carlos Fuentes' most important novel, even if, he, if it may not be his best, and I can tell you it is definitely not his most ambitious or his most experimental. So far, the book by Fuentes that I have enjoyed the most is Aura right here. But then, I, as you know, I am a novella guy, okay? So I am a little bit biased when it comes to that. I do have a copy of another one that I have not read, which is Change of Skin, Cambio de Piel, so I am definitely going to read this one. And I, I really do hope to be more enthusiastic about this longer novel based on what I know about it. This novel was dedicated to Julio and Aurora Cortázar, so it a, should be a, a very interesting text. I started reading it many years ago. I had to abandon the reading for other reasons. I think I had to read something for one of my classes, but uh, I do hope to enjoy it and and uh, I will definitely share with you my ideas on it when uh, I do that. So what I'm going to I'm going to do now is I'm going to say goodbye 
there's another little thing that I want to share with you as a kind of a coda to this video. So if you're interested in my experience meeting Carlos Fuentes, uh, you're welcome to stay. But I want to close the video right here. So do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Those are my two cents on The Death of Artemio Cruz by Carlos Fuentes. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day. So, if you're still with me, I want to tell you a little bit about my meeting with Carlos Fuentes. This was something that happened many years ago, uh, almost 15 years ago now, and I attended one of his readings. It was really an amazing experience. I remember clearly that he read from Where the Air is Clear. That was one of the most important things, and I thought that was really nice, because after so many years and publishing so many important books, he was still very close to where the air is clear. It's his first novel, right? The novel that made him famous and the key work of Mexican and Latin American literature. I wish I could tell you exactly what else he read from. It was one of his newer works. Maybe I'm thinking Vlad, that, that short story, but don't take my word on that because I am really not sure. I do remember where the air is clear. There was an interview with him, of course, and what I can tell you is that the sense that I got was that everybody in, in that room, and this was a theater, okay, so it was an auditorium, it was huge and packed with people, everybody just seemed to be spellbound, okay? Carlos Fuentes had such a magnetic personality. He, he really had an aura about him, so, so that is quite appropriate right there. I remember when we were leaving the place, somebody screamed at him. He was sitting there as we were all leaving, and, and somebody shouted at him, Carlos Fuentes, no se muera nunca. And I remember some people were laughing, because, of course, if you translate that, it translates as, don't ever die, right? And if you translate it into English, it doesn't quite sound like the thing to say to somebody, especially when they are advanced in age. And I remember somebody commenting, you know, that was a, that's a funny thing to say to Carlos Fuentes. But uh, believe me, in Spanish, it's not problematic at all. People say it all the time. Carlos Fuentes actually heard it, and, and he kind of chuckled. He, he laughed at it. So after that, after the reading and the interview, I stayed to have my copy of uh, The Death of Artemio Cruz signed. I was wondering, you know, which one should I get signed? I really, I had read Aura, right, and I enjoyed it very much, but my copy of Aura, which is one that a professor gave me, is kind of old and it was disintegrating, so I thought that this one was, would last a little bit longer. So I decided to go with La Muerte de Artemio Cruz and, and he uh, signed it for me right here. So uh, as I was in line, I was one of the last people, you know, I always wait uh, for the last, and there were two girls behind me who had a camera with them, and they asked me, uh, could you take a picture of us with him? And I was like, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, but can you take a picture of me also? Because I don't have a camera with me, I can give you my email and you can send it to me. So anyway, we went there, uh, I uh, shook his hand, I said, you know, thank you for the reading, and uh, for, for this presentation, for, for this wonderful evening. And he signed my book, and then I stood there, and the girls took a picture of me, then I waited, took a picture of them. So after that, we are looking at the pictures, and they tell me, oh my gosh, you know, your picture came out a little bit strange. And I was like, what do you mean by that? So I looked at it, I was standing here, you know, and it was the, the weirdest picture of me that I have ever seen. I was standing there, Carlos Fuentes was way behind, and he was like this, doing this. I was like, how did that happen? That is, that is really strange. Of course, what happened was that he was already trying to grab the book from the two girls who were behind me to, to sign it. So basically, I think what happened was that the flash, there was a little bit of a delay, and he assumed that the picture was already taken, and he just moved on to uh, the next people behind me. But I was like, okay, I have a picture with Carlos Fuentes, it doesn't matter. So I told the girls, oh, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. Now, here's the problem when you're dealing with a language that is not your own. To me, don't worry meant, in that context, don't worry about it, send me the picture, I want it just the same, right? It doesn't matter that the picture did not come out as well as I would have liked it to come out. But what they took it to mean was, don't worry, I don't want the picture because it is a weird one. And so that is the story of how I never got 
the picture of me with Carlos Fuentes and it's probably has probably been deleted or it is somewhere there inside a camera memory uh, in the camera that these two girls had so that was really unfortunate but at least I had the experience you know I can say that I shook Carlos Fuentes hand and he signed my book so that is the uh, interesting thing about this I forgot to tell you something so it's good that I included this part this little coda in the in the video you know one book that I would like to compare the death of Artemio Cruz with not because it's the same or anything like that, but because precisely of the contrast that I think I would I would find if I you know sat down to compare these two. I would like to compare it to this one, the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas by Machado de Assis. I think that would be a really, really interesting reading project. So I just wanted to throw that out there and I forgot to do it during the video. So I'm including it here. Thank you once again. Have a fantastic day, okay? Bye bye.